Hi, I'm Mitch and welcome to the Restoration Road as we continue our series, Street Smarts from Proverbs. And to help me do that is the doctor, the sports doctor, Tommy <laughs> Shagler. Tommy, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. And Sir William Robbins from Empowered Volleyball Academy, professional indoor and outdoor player, soon to be outdoor only. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Soon to be retired indoor and, yes, outdoor. And Lieutenant General Larry <laughs> Lee Lance, Mr. Youth for Christ. Thank you for being here, Larry. Good to be here. Always appreciate your insights. Um, today we're going to talk about really an interesting, almost mysterious topic from Proverbs, and it's how to speak with riddles or parabolic language. Kind of like girls are good at that, you know, <laughs> wives, they sort of talk around the subject and then we figure it out by the next day we figure by the it next out. day yeah. but as guys we don't do that very well so uh we're going to talk about how to become a person who asks and asks is an acronym okay so we're going to have an, a quiz today larry on whether we can remember how to be a person who asks would you like tommy to be the quiz taker today <laughs> Yeah, I'll assist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Tommy, the first letter is A, and what we want to do to bring more parabolic language uh, to our words is ask questions. I heard a marriage counselor say, ask open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. And have you ever tried that? It's the second principle we've been taught in our CTO study. Call to obedient? Yes, quit answering your wife's question with a statement because we want to make statements so you yes. need to learn to ask better questions such as um, here's what i heard you say just want to clarify i understood i mean words that help get more information if you need to but don't make statements what did you say and that, that mm. doesn't that doesn't work that reminds me one the one time i got it right uh, Susan had said something to me, and I said, oh, and I repeated back to her in my own words what she said, and here's what I thought she really meant, like in her heart, what she was feeling about it, and she smiled, and I go, because it was, I thought I was going to get heated, and I go, you like that, didn't you? She goes, yes. <laughs> I go, I don't know if I could ever do it again. <laughs> that was, that was uh, the one time I got it right. I think we're standing right by our closet. I remember that. Proverbs 18, 17 says, the first to present his case seems right. This is almost identical to what you just said. You always quote in scripture. Till another comes forward and questions him. We, there needs to be that dialogue of asking questions or we're really never gonna get to the heart of the matter with anybody. Um, you, you ask a lot of questions when you coach, when you diagnose fundamentals. I just not thought about that. I try to make sure that there's an understanding of what it should look like and feel like. Um, so that way, they at least when they walk away from a lesson or a practice, they at least have a good understanding of what the skill should look like and feel like, but then also when they do it wrong, they know exactly what they did wrong and then they're able to correct it. But if you can really try to explain it to them why what they're doing is wrong, how it could be dangerous, uh, maybe they're not gonna be as successful, maybe it limits um, their range of you know shots or whatever it is, and you can explain to them the right way, and then all the benefits, um, you know, then they really understand it. They may not be able to do it right away because it's not always a light switch that, oh, that's what you want me to do. Well, let me do it next time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a process and at least they have to first understand it um, and then they can start to kind of work through it and uh, you know, try to do it correctly. 2000 years ago, rabbis used to ask questions of each other. And so if I ask Larry a question, he's now gonna ask me a question which indicates I know what you're saying, but what about this? And we go down a layer deeper, down a layer deeper. It's kind of what Jesus did with Nicodemus in John 3. Um, but I got to thinking your whole career was asking questions through interviews. Yes. How do you determine what questions you're going to ask uh, of a coach or a player? Do you do that on the fly? Do you know going in? Uh, so... Most of the interviews I've done in my life have been conversations um, that I don't plan out beforehand. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of big interviews where I would jot down some thoughts that, I'm, that I might have, sit down type situations kind of like this where I might have something in front of me. Um, but 
I find to, to be able to ask questions in a successful way, you have to be, have a belief inside of you that you don't have the answer already. Wow. You know, let's uh, have an all a call, an <laughs> offering and have some people get baptized because that is you. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, if you just approach conversations in that manner, it, you usually end up gaining enlightenment from it, whether it's a sports interview or whether it's a business situation or, or a spiritual conversation. I think, it, I think it carries over to all conversations. I think that is tremendously insightful. Um, in, in conflict especially, we wanna ask questions that engage the heart. Uh, and I love what Tommy said, uh, that's why they call him doctor, mm -hmm. is that you don't know the answer already. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it feels kind of funny if somebody asks you the question and you know, they know the answer already, uh, you feel a little bit manipulated. Boy, we're getting in touch with our feminine side mm. today. <laughs> uh, so the A is? Asking questions. Ask, he's good. Wow, way better than the last guy we had. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> The S is the first letter. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I'll hold off my judgment in the next one. Just remember, you don't have the answers with well, right. right. <laughs> the first S is share a story. Share a story. Communicate through stories that bring images and experiences as opposed to what you said, Larry, uh, making statements. There's probably nothing that engages the heart more than a story. Um, you and I have a good friend that is a story writer in Bill Muir, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, he's probably inspired us both to think through stories and how our postmodern culture is engaged by stories anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Will, there was a really great teacher 2,000 years ago that talked in stories. Do you want to guess who that is, as if you were in Sunday school? Hmm. Bob Goff? Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 years ago. Oh, oh 2,000. It would have to be Jesus. Then. Jesus. Jesus. And, you know, one of the things <laughs> I've learned that's really interesting is that um, that's the way they still teach in the Middle East is through stories. Mm -hmm. And a parable is an earthly truth thrown alongside a spiritual one. And I, I just think I would thrive like in a university setting where they were teaching me through stories as opposed through our Western culture. We're very outline oriented and that kind of thing. Um, I was teaching at Blackhawk Ministries on Wednesday nights and I had a couple that God blew into the door and that night I actually got in front of everybody and said, I don't know what it is, but I feel like I'm not supposed to come and give my message. I'm supposed to ask questions and listen to what you have to say. And we went through the night and about in the next 25 minutes, about 13 people, if I remember correctly, shared stuff with me that was going on in their lives. And I took what I had prepared, I applied it to those things. And I said, is there anybody else? I just, the reason I'm asking is I just felt like um, God was telling me that somebody needs to surrender their lives to Christ. Hmm. And uh, kind of like an auctioneer, auctioneer, anybody else, anybody else, you know? And I closed the night. And it was powerful to hear all the things that were going on in people's lives. Well, I'm walking out and this couple stops me and this guy says, I think I'm your guy. I go, what do you mean? He proceeds to tell me how he was a criminal defense attorney, was at the top of that glass building in downtown Indianapolis, um, received payment one day in cocaine, kicked up a habit that he had when he was younger, loses everything, loses his practice. Uh, I believe he was uh, either disbarred or gonna be disbarred. Um, his wife is there, their marriage is a wreck. And we, we talk through some scriptures and she surrenders her life to Christ. He, he just, in his mind, he can't do it. I found out later they're walking out and he says to his wife, well, do you feel different? You feel different? What, what's going on? And she said, I feel tremendous peace. I don't know how to describe it. And she had miracle after miracle happen. She was pregnant 
uh, that next week she had miracle after miracle happen. They needed an air conditioner. Like the the man managing her business just gave her one. Didn't didn't know. It was just, hey, I have this hair conditioner. Do you need it? So things like that start happening to her. His eyes are getting big. He's wondering what's going on. He comes back the next week. He hears the message. I talked to him afterwards. And I said, you know, I just want to make sure uh, that, that you have this one concept straight. I said, are you trying to get cleaned up to come to God? Because you need to come to God to get cleaned up. He goes, if that's the case, I need him now. <laughs> he gets on his knees, surrenders his life to Christ. Um, his wife comes back alone the next week. She said he pawned our wedding rings and he bought drugs in the parking lot of the church. I didn't know he could do that. And uh, went out and went on a binge. But he seems to feel differently about it than he ever has before. That's the remorse, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So I said, hey, have him come back. And I, want, I, I, I don't want him to think that it's over because he did this. And I want the people here to realize this is messy. It might be two steps forward and one step back. So he comes the next night, a week later. I talk him into sharing his story, surrender, surrender his life to Christ and what he did and all that stuff. And uh, I had invited a woman who was my waitress that morning to come to the Common Ground service. She hears everything about that story and her hand goes up. And I said, yes. She said, Mitch, I just got out of Parkview Behavioral for addiction. I'm exactly where he was, and I want what he's got now. <laughs> and she came up, sat there with me. I walked her through some scriptures, and because she had heard their story, she surrendered her life to Christ. We went downstairs. She brought her 10-year-old daughter, 5-year-old daughter. They surrendered their lives to Christ. Um, all because of a story. I mean, that is just powerful, just amazing. But, I, you know, that's a true story. Um, I'm not really good at coming up with, like, parables, you know, making them up. But I remember once in seminary we had to uh, take a parable and make it a modern-day one. And it really uh, enlightens you on what the parable is really saying 2,000 years ago. And I just, that, that one exercise just made me realize how powerful Jesus was as a teacher, the greatest teacher ever to walk the earth, obviously. What do you think is about a story that engages us so much? I think it depends on what kind of story it is, but obviously for stories like, um, whether it's a movie you go to or a, a fictional story, it's the imagination, it's the, it's the possibilities mm. of, of a story. I guess that possibilities of a story carry over whether it was true or whether it wasn't true because the person hearing it doesn't exactly know where where it's going so that feeling um probably carries through no matter what there's there's a rawness to stories i mean i you know the youth for christ tagline is give life to your story and we're constantly teaching kids so you know our three little circles god's story your story my story well me sharing my story with you, but listening to your story and then trying to figure out how you connect that to God's story is what we do in ministry every day, all day with kids. Mm -hmm. But there's a rawness to it of me connecting with you and hearing your story and trying to connect the dots. And I always find the longer you talk, you will find dots to connect. There are shared experiences. Doesn't matter if you're 63 and the kid's 17, there's shared experiences. When they start talking about how their mom or dad has treated them, and I can relate back to what my mom or dad did. You have this mutual rawness of you're sharing emotions, you're sharing yeah. experiences, yeah. and now you're engaged in, the, you're part of the story. Yeah. It's not about my story anymore, it's our story. Yeah, exactly. And once you get to the place to where you're both resonating, it's so easy to transition to, let me, let me interject how God plays into this, and now God's in the story. That, I mean, there's nothing more energizing, I don't think, than getting to that place with people. Mm. That's powerful. And this uh, pattern, being a person who asks, come from, comes from an actual pattern that Jesus did in Luke 20. It's amazing. He asks questions. He shares a story. 
And then the next thing he does is he, key, he keys on the other person's perspective. So key on the other person's perspective. He does it with uh, a puzzle. But again, this is a mysterious way to bring parabolic language to your conversation. And, and how do you do that? You know, how do you come up with a puzzle on the fly or something like that? I think it's challenging, but it's worth, I think, digging into and saying, you know, how can I do that? At least I can do the first part. I can start keying on that other person's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the coach that you got into it with and how you uh, finally after some years talked about it and had the reconciliation um, at that moment you keyed on each other's perspective otherwise that wouldn't have happened we talk a lot um, in the professional world about understanding another person's reality um, it's so easy to get caught up on you know not take the five seconds and 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 all of those things and just think about what it is where you're coming from and uh, if you don't if you don't allow yourself the the ability to open your your heart up, your mind up to another person's perspective, then you're not going to really ever be able to gain any real insight from them. That's beautiful. You key on other people's perspectives in the competition, I think, <clears throat> as well. I mean, it's a tool to know what the opponent's trying to do. Yeah, I think like any sport... Um, it becomes kind of a chess match. And so you're trying to analyze, you know, what they're doing, um, the offense that they're running, the defense that they're playing. And so you try to get in your opponent's mind, to try to figure out their thought process in order to then counteract what they're doing with something that they obviously can win in that situation against their offense or their defense. So, yeah, it really is. It's a constant, um, you know, just – being observant, you know, watching what they're doing, hearing what they're saying, um, and try to formulate in your mind kind of what they're thinking, what their game plan is, and then, yeah, trying to put a game plan together yourself um, to be able to, you know, counteract what they're doing and be successful. So, Larry, why don't we take time to key on our wives' perspectives and develop a game plan? Why don't we? Why don't we? <laughs> Yeah. I think some of us do, but back to the competition, we're trying to beat them, so we're only <laughs> trying to counteract what they're saying. And that's true, but the other thing is, is what we do, and I think we all do it, male, female, whatever, is as you're talking to me, I'm already engaged in thinking of what my response is going to be, and I probably heard half of what you said. Mm -hmm. So I interpreted mm -hmm. something and didn't listen carefully enough because I'm already going whether it's one-upmanship or I just feel like I want to make a point, I, I, I don't listen carefully enough. And we're talking about questions. Even there's bad questions. Right. So it's even the art of asking the right, right questions, question. dealing with a guy that's got some marriage struggles. And, and he says, here's an example. I'm driving home the other night and I talk to her a little bit and she jumps all over me on the phone. And I go, well, what did you say? And he goes, I said, my first thing I said was, what did you do today? And I go, let me tell you what your wife just heard. I'm lazy. I don't do anything around the house. I mean, she went through her top 10 list of everything. I go, you don't say that. You say, how was your day, honey? Can I pick something up on the way home? You do that. You'll have a nice meal when you get home, a smile on your face. And so it, it's really how we even present questions that helps. And, and, and Jesus was the master at asking the right question. Will you give me a drink? That's the first question he said to the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. He didn't talk about her sin. He didn't talk, I mean, will you give me a drink? Mm -hmm. What a way to engage a person. Yeah. I wouldn't key on my wife's perspective when I saw some leafy substances that looked like weeds in this area <laughs> by our daylight basement windows. And she said something to me about, you might not want to do that in your workout clothes and with you know all your arms and legs exposed. And I said, I have pulled every weed on that 13 and a half <laughs> acres over there. I've never had poison ivy in my life. It's not an issue. I'm telling you, Larry, <laughs> I had never had poison ivy. It was horrid, horrid. And to compound the problem, a nurse practitioner gave me 
the wrong stuff. And I was rubbing it on, it was pasty, it was too hard. And it's just like making it worse. And I feel like I'm gonna <laughs> die. And then I feel like everything I touched, I got there. Uh, uh, it was horrible. And all I had to do was key in on that little girl's perspective that I used to talk to in eighth grade English class and get in trouble for talking but <laughs> I didn't do it. It would have saved me a lot of trouble. The A in be a person who asks is? Ask questions. Ask questions. The first S is? Share a story. Share a story. The K is? Key, key on, on their perspective. perspective. And this is a toughie because you gotta do it with humility and wisdom. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's gonna come off as lording it over. Speak scripture. Mm. speak scripture and that's what mm -hmm. Jesus did uh, when he's encountering the Sadducees he's, and he's obviously he was really good at it <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the writer of Hebrews says for the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart man speaking scripture humbly and wisely can change anything. Um, mm. And now that's like this. Um, let's say it's not like this. Larry, Proverbs 15, one says, a harsh word stirs up anger, uh, but a gentle answer turns away wrath. You're being pretty harsh here, Larry, Lieutenant Larry. <laughs> you Lieutenant know, General. Lieutenant General Larry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not going to work. Um, but maybe more like, uh, oh, man, Larry, I, and thinking about where you apply it. Oh, what direction you apply it. Oh, man, Larry, I, I was reading this morning in Proverbs 15, 1 says, a harsh word stirs up anger, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Larry, whatever I do here, I want to make sure I'm gentle. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be harsh anyway. That's like night and day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Those two things. The direction of where it's... Uh, pointed and then the tone in which it's shared. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you pray out loud with your wife? Yes. Do you think she like likes that? Yes. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a woman farther down the road than I am in the faith journey say that a woman wants love according to Paul, a guy wants respect. And she says, I think when the husband prays audibly for the wife, all of that happens at that moment. Mm. All of that happens at that moment. So I think that's a, uh, the reason I thought about that is scripture comes out as we pray and reading the Bible together, I think is another huge deal. Do you do that at all? <clears throat> yeah, and I'm setting up examples today of, I mean, for Becky, she's grown so much through this study. And so our daughter-in-law who's pregnant, having a baby, she every once in a while asks for a prayer and Becky would snap a few sentences back. And so today, she had two prayer requests about selling their house and stuff, and Becky had two responses, and they were both just scripture passages. Wow. So there was no answer of anything other than Jeremiah 29, 11 and Matthew 6, 33, and, and those were her answers. And you sit there and go, well, that's interesting. But yet when you read them, those are the perfect answers. That's the best thing I can do for you, is remind you that God's got this. Mm -hmm. If you seek him first, all these other things will be added on to you. So it's, it's not you, it's God's word. And that penetrates because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He uses his word to penetrate our hearts and our souls to give us the understanding and the knowledge. And so mm. it's, it's, it's great exercise to do that as often as we can. Kind of touching on what you were talking about. I mean, I think, you know, when you bring forth the scriptures that pertain to those situations, you know, that's the final authority, you know, that's the word of God, as opposed to me bringing up my own personal opinions based on my emotions or my experiences. And in the end, you know, it, we live this life and you guys see it all the time. People always have their opinions and their perspectives. And in the end, you know, what I try to say is, is oh, I, I'd like to understand what you're, where you're coming from. You know, do you have any scriptures, you know, that, you know, that kind of pertain to that? Or, you know, what does the Bible say about that? Um, what you find out a lot of times is a lot of our own opinions or the opinion, opinions of others are, are not based on scripture. Um, and so I think when you do bring forth scripture in the right and correct way um, and be able to kind of use that 
to affirm, you know, what you're, what you're talking about in the situation. I think it just adds validity to it and it gives a better understanding of, oh, that's God's perspective. That's the absolute truth, not that's your perspective. And that's, you know, that can be swayed by your emotions or whatever, you know, the intentions of your heart really are. Um, so I think there's just so much more power um, when you can come, come with actual scriptures. Um, and I think it yes. helps to ease the conversations as well, because then it gets you both focusing on God and his word. And what does God have to say about this situation? Not what you believe or your opinions or your, you know, your emotions are, are bringing forward. And so, yeah, I, I think anytime, you know, and devotions are great with your wife, um, just because you can, as you're, you know, going through the devotion and you're reading the scriptures and you're seeing how it's applied through a story a lot of times to real life, it it starts to kind of help it come alive in your hearts and in your minds and you start to really understand what the scriptures are saying and it helps to kind of guide the conversation towards what God really wants, you know, for us and not just what you want or, you know, your selfish, you know, um, you know, thoughts are, or, you know. So, yeah, I think, yeah, once you can dig into the scriptures or you can use the scriptures in a conversation, if you can bring it, you know, bring the scripture forward, uh, they can help to see how it applies and how it is the truth and the word of God and ultimately the correct answer. Mar, think about it. It affects us as the person sharing the scripture uh, as much, if not more so, than the person we're sharing it with. Again, we're trying to apply it to ourselves anyway, but you can't even start sharing that without thinking through, oh, just what Will said, you know, I, I got to be doing this. Tommy, you ready for the quiz? Yep. We're going to be a person who asks riddles, Questions. bringing parabolic language to our uh, conversations in conflict. The A is? Ask questions. Ask questions. S. The S, the first S is? Share a story. Share a story. K? Key on perspective. Key on the other person's perspective. He's good. That's why he's a doctor. <laughs> And can he bring it home with a final S? Speak scripture. Yes. Speak. Nailed it, Tommy. Speak. Speak scripture. S-S. Yes. So it's really A-S-K-S-S. Oh. You have to change that. Okay. Pitch. We'll change that in the book. Ask. <laughs> Apply it this week. Be a person who asks. Yeah, it's, yeah. he's a doctor. You. He needs more letters behind his name. <laughs> the second edition will be out before the first. <laughs> Continue to pursue street smarts from Proverbs and become a person who asks. My name is Chip Clark. I work with Youth for Christ, uh, overseeing our urban ministries. Uh, I am so excited to endorse this book. My dad raised me uh, to read a proverb a day. 31 a day, he said, would keep the, the, the devil away. So I believe that this book and uh, match with uh, the heart from Mitch Cruz to, to hear stories, to, to bring stories to life, uh, will be a great read for you.